Hello Astro students, um, here is part one of a four-part video series for the SDSS Voyages um, Hubble Diagram Project. Um, this is the first uh, page, a simple diagram after the introductory page. Um, I just want to point out a couple things about each of these sections. First, I, I do love this project, but I don't like this terminology. We never go about proving anything in science. All we can show is something that's verified. Um, and consistent with uh, observations and our expectations. Um, we can disprove stuff, we can never prove stuff. That, If you want to learn more about that, go read Karl Popper and his ideas about falsifiability. He was a philosopher of science. Um, distances. So the first part about all of this is putting together a simple diagram that correlates distance with redshift. Uh, we talked about the apparent sizes of galaxies, that if they appear larger or smaller, that might mean that they are closer or further away. Brighter galaxies mean they're probably closer. Uh, dimmer galaxies means they are a little bit further away. Um, and that's because our assumptions with galaxies is that they are all approximately the same size and brightness, but it's not a perfect assumption. Remember that the Hubble, or the, the Sloan Sky Survey, not the Hubble, the Sloan Sky Survey has two different filters, or sorry, five different filters, U, G, R, I, and Z. So we have an ultraviolet, green, red, and two infrared wavelengths, I and Z. Um, exercise one was to basically take this data and write down one of the, the filter um, magnitudes. Um, let's look at one of these data pieces right here. I'm going to make this window a little bit bigger. I want this side to keep some notes open. Um, any one data entry for any, any galaxy or star or anything observed by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, has a page like this. So what is the magnitude of the object across all five filters? Um, what are uncertainties? This is all location information. This is all... Um, database sort of sampling information. Um, there's always going to be some kinds of notes and flags on the file, uh, something that you may or may not want to know. Um, you have some other observations here. Oh, yeah, and other observations code, and you have to look up what the code is. Um, this thing called the Petro Radius, we'll look that or we'll look at that um, in another video. And then the spectra, if it has a uh, spectral uh, recording. And so there is a redshift given here, and notice that that is also labeled with C, which is different from the Z of the magnitude. But the redshift is also given on the spectrum, and it's nice to look at the whole spectrum because you get a bit more, uh, you get a bit more um, decimals, you get more significant digits on the redshifts listed above the spectrum than you do on the database entry. Um, and for our purposes, we want to use that precision. We only go to 0 0.009 here, but this actual full spectral reading here gives you 0 0.00893. So let's go with taking redshifts from the actual spectrum chart uh, as we proceed through this project. So all of these have similar entries that give you the coordinates, uh, the right ascension and declination, just so you have enough information to know that you know, you're looking at a particular object, and that's all exercise one was, record a magnitude. Um, question one, why can magnitudes be used as a substitute for distances? That's the assumption of brighter means closer. Again, not a perfect assumption, but that's the assumption that we're working with for this first basic diagram. Next part of this are redshifts, and we get those from looking at a spectrum and looking at where expected lines shift to. So if we, if we list a hydrogen alpha right here, um, we're going to expect that actually in a rest frame to be somewhere over here at 656 nanometers or 6,563, um, uh, 636.3, um, or 6,563 angstroms. But it's way over here past 7,000 angstroms or 700 nanometers. That means this line has been shifted because the object is moving away from us. Um, other note, galaxy uh, spectra are going to be pretty flat, maybe with a big dip somewhere, um, but not, uh, not like a black body. 
And that's because galaxies are made up of a whole bunch of black bodies. So we'll look at that back and, and when we look at the redshifts. Um, so exercise two, again, is just finding redshifts for each of those same entries. Exercise three is make a graph. Um, and exercise four is fit a linear model, meaning add a trend line. So I have this ready to go in a spreadsheet to demonstrate to you. Um, here's the tab that has it. This spreadsheet is linked um, in OneNote and in a couple of the daily pages. Um, and I'll put it in the, the notes for this video as well. Um, you can view it, you can download it, you can use it as a template for your own work as well. Um, what I did here is I actually took the redshifts and all of the magnitudes just to show some differences that you'll find here. Um, when I go back to the, the database, and let's say I was copying one of these object IDs just to put it into my spreadsheet just so I have it as a reference, I can't just paste it in this way because Excel is going to turn it into some kind of scientific notation number. My way around that is to type an apostrophe first and then paste it and then I get a number. And so that way I can always plug this number back into uh, the database search and come back to that specific entry. So that is the, the Galaxy's official title in the Sloan Digital Sky Surveys database. Um, my graph here has, again, redshift on the horizontal and magnitude in the vertical, which is a little different from a typical Hubble diagram. We usually have magnitude or the proxy for distance on the horizontal and redshift or the velocity on the vertical, but it doesn't matter. We're just trying to find if there is a correlation between redshift and magnitude, one that we can observe and present and characterize how good of a correlation it is. So that's where this R squared number comes in. It tells us how good of a correlation that we have uh, between the two um, different axes or the quantities plotted on those axes. The uh, closer to one it is, the better the correlation, meaning all the data points will line up closer along that straight line. Um, interesting to note that the one that has the worst correlation is the, the U filter. This makes sense to me because ultraviolet doesn't get through our atmosphere very well. Um, galaxies typically also don't give off very much ultraviolet because most of the stars in a galaxy are going to be somewhere on the red dwarf side of a spectrum, uh, maybe yellow, and not actually emitting that much ultraviolet. It's only the young hot stars that will do that. So ultraviolet is not going to necessarily be a good uh, filter to use to, to make some kind of distance measurement. Also, if light from galaxies gets more redshifted, we're expecting what might originally appear in the red filter might appear in the eye filter uh, if it's coming from very far away. So stuff gets redshifted, we want to look actually more in the infrared, and that's, again, what this survey is designed to do. All of these give a pretty good correlation. I color-coded uh, kind of opposite what they should be. R is with green, and green is with red, but that's okay as long as you label stuff. Um, it's good practice to label all of your uh, parts of your chart. So under the chart design, um, menu, you can always add a chart element, titles, labels, all of this. So you just want to make sure that a chart looks as clear as possible um, and is as easy to understand as possible for somebody reading it. Assume that it's somebody else who is working on the same project. Um, I'm going to go back to our project instructions here. Exercise five was to repeat gathering data, and, and this goes into exercise six, and this was giving using some other galaxies given and these were selected by the project creators I used the R filter here um, to give you a result that is not so good because you can show with very small numbers of galaxies that this may not hold and so when we really want to do this for real we if we really want to show that there's a correlation between this we would, we would take thousands of galaxies and try to plot this and that's what professional studies will do. Um, Hubble worked with what he could at the time, and he got maybe tens and hundreds of galaxies by the end of the 1930s, but we have far more to work with now. And again, the point of this is just to show you can handpick some data because what these are showing is that um, 
the assumptions that we make are actually going to lead us astray sometimes. So if I click on any one of these from the second data set, the one that's shown, that's designed to give us some bad results, look at this. There is a flag here. Um, this galaxy is a very edge-on spiral. So this actually might be a bright galaxy, but we're only seeing the edge of it. So this is not going to give us a, a very good estimate of the magnitude. We can go to the next one here. Let that open up. And yeah, there is another flag. Um, I think all of these uh, hand-picked, quote, bad data points are all flagged in some way to because they're all suspect. Uh, bad moving fit. Um, I wonder what this means. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting notes that are shorthand, and you can look up in a lot of the... Uh, the documentation for the Sloan Sky Survey, what this actually means. But again, these were all selected by the uh, the authors of this whole um, activity to show that you're not always going to get a fit, especially if you're only looking at six galaxies. So by the end of this project, hopefully we're going to have some more galaxies to work with. So that's the end of part one. Again, to summarize, what we really have is a set of information of redshift and magnitude and a plot of some galaxies that show there is a correlation, and a summary or a set of data of redshift and magnitude for galaxies that show there isn't a correlation. And um, the question in this, the one question in this section, um, why can magnitudes be used as a substitute for distances in the Hubble diagram? That to some degree you can assume that the dimmer a galaxy is, the further away it is. Um, when galaxies get um, when two galaxies are relatively close to each other, not close to us, but close to each other, then that assumption uh, will start to lead you astray. So that's the end of part one. Um, the next part will be on um, taking the magnitudes in another method to determine distances.